Welcome, David, to Seven Cromwell Place, the home of Percy Granger for 40 years. It's delighted you could come along today for this discussion. And I just wondered if you'd like to sort of give us a brief um, um, details about your career so far and what you've been doing. Certainly. Well, thank you very so much for having me here. It's great to be up here at the house of Percy Granger in White Plains, New York. Uh, it's honestly like uh, stepping into a time machine when you come back here. Mm -hmm. I understand that most of the furniture and the layout of the home is basically as Granger left That's it right. in 1961. Um, so I am a trombonist in the United States Navy Band in Washington, D.C., and occasionally I have um, been uh, solicited to write uh, various arrangements of orchestral music as well as uh, organ music for the band, and uh, with that... Uh, sort of established reputation, I was asked in 2014 to take a piece of Percy Granger's that I was not very familiar with, the Indahomey Cake Box Masher, and write that for concert band uh, with the idea that it was going to be premiered at the Midwest Band and Orchestra Clinic in Chicago, Illinois in December of 2014, and that did happen, and uh, since that time the band uh, has recorded it, and actually we're going to listen to that later on. Sure. But uh, um, before I get ahead of myself, uh, Barry, yeah. I wanted to actually ask you sure. if you could give us a little bit of uh, background on the piece, because I know you were rather a, a large part of getting this piece finally into print in the 1980s. Yeah, sure. Well, it, <clears throat> it was a rather strange series of events that happened. I was, I visited, first came here uh, to this house 40 years ago. And I met Stuart and Ella for the first time. Stuart Manville was Ella Granger's second husband. Mm -hmm. And Ella was, um, it was the year of her 89th birthday. And I, I came over with the pianist, Scottish composer, pianist Ronald Stevenson, mm -hmm. because he was giving a birthday recital for her in a local concert hall, which doesn't exist anymore, called the Fry Studio. And I remember clearly that the first one of the first things Stuart did to me, he suddenly gave me a letter <clears throat> from a gentleman in England and the letter was saying that this that the, the writer of the letter had had in his possession the original manuscript of Indahomey, Percy's original manuscript because he described it in the letter that certain passages of it were written in red ink. Red ink. Um, it's uh, a few years went by. I, I, I went home that year and I put the letter in, in a file somewhere. Didn't think any more about it until Ronald um, got a, a contract with C.F. Peters Company in New York to do an edition of that work in Dahomey as well as also uh, the three Scottish folk songs that Percy wrote later in his life. And when he was asked to do this contract, he said, would I do the music processing for it? And in those days, I used to either do it by hand, and then after that, I, I used a music typewriter. Now, this was a, a, a machine that was a converted um, Olympia typewriter with a long carriage, and the normal type had been replaced by music characters. So the actual production of music on it was very laborious. And you had to type the stave, the stave lines or the staff mm -hmm. lines. And then once you've done that, you had to then put in the notes. And then when you'd put in the notes, you then had to take the paper out and do all the ruling of the, of the, of the, the beams and the crescendo markings and the phrase markings. So, I mean, a page of music could take you a, a couple of days. Mm. And so... Uh, Don Gillespie, who worked for C.F. Peters, um, contracted me to do the engraving work for Indahomey. And it was then, uh, the only manuscript we had at that time was um, a manuscript that wasn't in Percy's hand, that was in the museum in Melbourne, the Granger Museum in Melbourne, Australia. And we were not sure who's this, who the hand was of this manuscript. Mm -hmm. It's been suggested that it might be Rose Granger's, but it's, it's his mother. His mother, yes, but it's quite a, a it's quite a detailed manuscript, and it's quite long. And I'm not sure whether she would have been up to doing something that long. I've seen, I've seen other manuscripts of hers of short songs, 
but not such a lengthy piece as Indahomey was. So we, we only had that to work from. And then Ronald said to me one day, um, God, wouldn't it be great if we had Percy's original manuscript? And a bell went off in my head, and I remembered this letter. And that was several years after the fact? Yes, it was, a, it was at least... I came here 78, it was, what was, when was the work published, 87? 87, yes. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's at least, yeah, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's quite a while after anyway, so. Um, I, I took out the letter and I read the name of the man again, and I can't remember the man's name now, because um, it's going back quite a while, and I remember ringing director inquiries in England, which is used to be able to phone up and say, do you have a phone number for Mr. So-and-so living at this address? It's the sort of thing you can't do now. Mm -hmm. And the, the operator said, yes, we've got, to, we've got two numbers for that name. So I said, well, you better give them both to me. So I wrote them down and then immediately dialed the first number and a woman answered and she said, um, I said, does this man live here? Um, and she said, no, he, he left a long time ago and he doesn't live here anymore. And then I rang the second number and another woman answered and I said, does this man live here? Um, is he a musician? And she said, yes. And she said, could you call back later this evening? Which I did and I spoke to this man. Now at that time I was living in um, a suburb of East London, which was really in the county of Essex, but it was within the Greater London area. Um, and it, uh, it was a, a, a town called Seven Kings. And the man, when I eventually spoke to this man, he said to me, um, I said, do you, do, you have the, do you still have this original manuscript? I said, you wrote a letter to Stuart Manville many years ago about Indahomey. Do you still have it? He said, no, I had to give it back to the owner. So I said, well, who is, who is the owner? So he said, oh, it's a lady who lives in Aylesbury in Buckinghamshire. Okay. So he gave me her contact details. I rang her up, spoke to her, and we had a very convivial conversation, and I explained to her what we were going to do. We wanted to consult this original manuscript because... Um, we were publishing the work and we wanted to compare it with the one we had. So she said, that's fine. She said, I'll send it to you. So I said, well, that's very kind of you. Um, but can you just tell me a bit about the history of how, how you have it? So she said, well, I inherited it through my second marriage to a grandson, I think, of the, of the dedicatee, which was William Gare Rathbone, Rathbone. The, Rathbone, the financier. So she sent it to me. Um, it wasn't registered, it wasn't recorded, it was just sent in the ordinary mail. <laughs> it's the sort of thing you could never do nowadays for risk of losing something. And it arrived at my home in Seven Kings, and of course I opened it up, and there in front of me was the original manuscript. Mm. So the first thing I did, which is what an archivist does, is I rushed up to the photocopy shop, photostat shop, and made two copies, and I coloured, uh, because there weren't coloured copies in those days, I coloured over the sections that were in red with a red, red ink, red pen. Mm -hmm. And I sent one of those copies to the Melbourne New Museum and kept the other one in my archive. Mm -hmm. And it was about a year or maybe six months after that, I actually moved house and went to live in Aylesbury in Buckinghamshire. Ah, I see. <laughs> well, it's probably worth noting at this point that I have here a copy of your copy. This is <laughs> the manuscript that you photocopied That's all it. those years ago. That's it, yeah. Uh, and this there was, it is. The, you were kind enough to send a photocopy to the United States Navy Band. I did. And yeah. uh, I was able to make a photocopy of that. That was in 2014. That was it? in 2014, the yeah. year that I wrote the arrangement. And it's oh. worth mentioning that just not an hour ago, we were at FedEx Kinko's and we made a copy of this manuscript to yes. donate to the museum here yes. in White Plains. Yes. Which, which I didn't do at the time. Right. So mm -hmm. now the. Uh, so we have, one for the, we have one for the house now. Mm -hmm. 
That's terrific. I mean, this this I mean, this takes me back to the time when I did it. But the amazing thing about this manuscript is the this big cartouche on the front on the mm -hmm. front of the music page, um, which says. Uh, uh, dedication for W. G. Rathbone, and then it's the cryptic statement: "For you have always been so good to it." And we're not quite sure what that refers to. But the amazing thing is that this um, in the homey uh, was was a musical that um, had been on Broadway. What year was it on Broadway? I believe it was 1903. It was the same year that they travelled over to mm -hmm. Britain. Yeah. And on the 16th of May, 1903, I think it's the Shaftesbury Theatre mm -hmm. in London. Yeah, the Shaftesbury Theatre in London. There was one performance of it, and Percy Granger and W.G. Rathbone went to it. So whether this refers to Rathbone's patronage, being a financier, he, he may have been a patron to the Music Hall Theatre, I don't know. But uh, it's always it's always puzzled me that statement. Can I ask a question? Sure. Based on complete ignorance of music, so he, we started out with Percy's document, and you converted it to orchestra. Can you explain to somebody who doesn't know music what that really sure. means? So this this was uh, originally a piano piece, but uh, just to go back a little bit further, this was based on a melody from. Will Marion Cook's musical of the same name, In Dahomey, and this was premiered on Broadway in 1903. And before we get into the specifics of writing this piece for concert band, actually, not orchestra, um, I think it's worth mentioning that Will Marion Cook was uh, one of the first students to come out of a new New York conservatory for music students that was headed up by Antonin Dvorak, who was the Bohemian composer who came over to the United States and wrote the New World Symphony No. 9 here in the United States, in Iowa actually, and shortly after his time there, moved to New York and basically shocked the um, community in New York when he told them that he wanted to have both white and black students studying together, which was uh, revolutionary at the time. And Will Marion Cook and Duke Ellington were both some of the first graduates from that school and Will Marion Cook went on to study in Berlin, was a violinist, came back to the United States and began writing musicals uh, in sort of this new ragtime uh, style that was uh, catching on right at that time in the early 1900s. And uh, the, the document's actually available online. I found this on Google. You can, you can download the entire short score of the musical. Um, is there any recording of the original music? There are recordings available, yes. Uh, the music still gets played from time to time. But uh, So in 1903, as Barry was saying, uh, Percy attended the only performance in London of the piece and was so taken by some of the cakewalks that were in there that he sat down and started uh, working on an improvised cakewalk of his own for piano that was based on some of those themes. And uh, this actually happened, I think, for about six years, 1903 to yeah. 1909. <coughs> it was, was when he it. was on tour. Mm -hmm. He was using it as an encore. Um, so, I, and I, I don't think I've spoken with you about this yet, but I believe that because he had uh, performed it in so many different ways, that's why we have these different versions that sort of evolved. And he was maybe of a mindset where he wasn't sure which version to put down on paper, so he and he put down more than one. Well, it's not, it's not the only example where he does that right. in some of his piano writing. Right. He leaves sections out and he says, at, at the will of the pianist. You know. Sure. I mean, in, uh, I mean, in some later, later cases, he would cut things out because he was um, uh, timing himself to catch the train back home. <laughs> so, I mean, but I'm not sure that was the case then because it was written out on, on the ship. And, yes. and there's that amusing story that... Um, he, he, he said um, that he, uh, he put the final notes in uh, Aden, Har Aden Harbour because Aden at that time belonged to the British Empire right? and he didn't want to sign anything on a, on a, on a, on a, in a German country or something to yes, that effect. I think, I think that's it's in the notes to the published edition. Well, and I think it comes from a letter that's catalogued in the farthest north of human. Yes, it would be, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So he yeah. was... 
was writing his then girlfriend at the time. That's right. That was Karen Holton. Right. Describing mm -hmm. describing his uh, thoughts on it. So, so Percy wrote this down in 1909 after having played it as an encore in a concert piece for six years, um, and I think it's just it bears repeating that this was basically laying in a drawer for all those years. It, it was laying, uh, yeah, so it was laying in Mrs. Hammond's mm -hmm. in Aylesbury's family, <laughs> right. family vault right. or whatever. Right. I mean, I don't think she knew what she had, really. Mm -hmm. But she, I don't know how her, her, I don't know what her connection was with this gentleman that had written to Stuart, mm -hmm. but he must have been interested in Granger. Maybe she said to him, oh, I've got a Granger manuscript you might like to see. Right. But I've no way of proving that. But the fact of the matter is that shortly after she sent it to me and we, we had enough time to consult it, she asked for the return of it, which I did. Oh, right. And then the next thing, it, um, Burnett Cross, who was Percy's young physicist friend who helped him with his free music machines, wrote to me saying that the work had appeared in the catalogue of a music sale at Sotheby's in London right. and they were asking £600 for it. Well, I mean, six hundred pounds. What today's it's about eight, eight hundred and fifty dollars. I just didn't have that sort of money then. Oh, sure. Otherwise, I would have bought the thing. And I know that the museum never bought it, mm -hmm. so I have no idea where where it ended, where it's ended up. Yeah, it's probably in some private collection today. It's probably in a yeah, exactly as you said. Uh, the only thing I can tell you is that when I was in the museum in two thousand and twelve, looking through a box of other material, other music. And just to confirm, this is the museum in Melbourne? So, yeah, the museum in Melbourne, yeah, sorry. Um, I came across one little half page of a section of Indahomey in Percy's manuscript. Mm -hmm. And that's the only original manuscript of that that the, the museum has. Mm. And did they know they even had it? They didn't even know they had it because there's no, no nobody in the Granger Museum is a musician. They're all art, art they're museologists, art, art historians. I see. So they wouldn't have been able to read the music. Right. So it got filed in a box with other things from around the same time. Okay. So if there's anyone out there who's listening to this, knows where the original manuscript ended up, please let us know. Right. <laughs> Well, so to answer your question, um, I, I feel like we've given enough uh, contextual background yes. to uh, w what this piece is, but it, I just want to say thank you so much for uh, doing your due diligence to, to find this and make sure that it ended up getting published. Um, because it, there are so many different ways that you can perform this that as I was trying to build my vision of what this piece was going to sound like, I needed some sort of concrete platform to actually use to create my version. So I happened to find a recording online, a live encore performance uh, performed by Marc-André Amlan, who's a French-Canadian pianist, and he wrote, um, rather, he performed this piece in such a way that it just, uh, it's got a very infectious, uh, it, there's a certain je ne sais quoi, if you will, with the way he does it. and. He puts certain cuts in and takes uh, several different optional uh, endings and things like that that are throughout the piece, and I decided to base my version on that. So um, I sat down, and I, I've actually—I I wish I had my original um, <coughs> sketch of the piece. I was just working off of a photocopy of the music, trying to come up with a way to combine the instruments in ways that would honor Granger's approach, because. Granger is very much, uh, uh, we, we sort of um, hold him in very high esteem in the concert band world, all the music that he wrote, uh, Lincoln Sherposey, as well as uh, all of his arrangements of uh, different folk songs, and uh, the, there's just a, a whole catalog, in fact we were just talking about this 19 CD project that was put up by Chandos that has most of his concert band music in there. So it's it's uh, so commonly performed. In fact, the Navy Band was just at the White House a few weeks ago where we performed on Easter Monday several of his pieces to include Irish Tune from County Derry. So with this um, large catalog of music, I wanted to try and 
make it sound as though Granger himself had done this arrangement, and that required me studying uh, several of his pieces, um, most of which was uh, Shepherd's Hay. I'm not sure if the audience is familiar with that piece of his, but uh, also Blythe Bells, which is his arrangement of a of a cantata movement of J.S. Bach. How many hours did you spend on this project? It sounds like an enormous. Well, I was effort. asked. I was asked to uh, begin work on this in about February 2014, and I. I finished the first draft in about September, so I guess that puts it right at about seven months, but near the end there was a couple weeks in there where I was probably doing 80 to 100 hours a week, just right. trying to make sure that I had everything exactly in the right place. But most of the preliminary work that I did was um, just studying these other pieces of his and trying to come up with an instrumentation that was standard to the way he wrote for band, and it was a very specific sound with Granger, uh, just having sat inside bands for these 30 years or so since I started in junior high, which is a long time ago for me personally, um, where there's a uh, just a very full sound that he was able to achieve by combining the instruments in a certain way with uh, featuring saxophones a lot, I, I believe. Did he start on saxophone, or, or I know that was one of his instruments along um, the way? Yeah, he bought, a, he bought a soprano saxophone to enter the army. He walked to Fort Totten and uh, enlisted with us uh, the, into the 15th Coast Artillery okay. Band. But there are, there are conflicting stories about that, because some, some people, some news reports say that he, he auditioned to play the clarinet. Or uh, and another one say he auditioned playing the oboe. Okay, so that's already. But he loved the soprano saxophone. Mm -hmm. Well, he loved all the saxophones. But the right. soprano was his favorite. Yeah. Well, so I knew that soprano saxophone was definitely one of his favorite instruments, and I decided to actually feature that instrument prominently in this arrangement. Uh, we've got a really fantastic saxophone section in the Navy band, and uh, they just took to those soloistic parts very quickly. And you'll hear in just a few minutes when we play the arrangement for you that uh, the saxes do have quite a lot of work to do. So, but there was a lot of, um, as I said, preliminary research, just trying to capture the sound of the era, the early 1900s, where uh, ragtime and cakewalks were uh, rather uh, popular. And this is before the beginnings of uh, true jazz and the big band era. So. In many ways, I wanted this to sound as though Granger had written it, but I also wanted to try and reflect the sort of um, this very light-hearted kind of. Uh, if you if you think back to the the scoring of silent film, even from that time, there's a a very thin orchestration because those those groups were not always um, very large. So I try to come back to a very small grouping of instruments every so often. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that was very helpful in this uh, edition that Barry put together was uh, one of the markings that Ronald Stevenson put in there was there's a, a glissando in the left hand in the piano and it says almost like a trombone glissando and so I thought that it would be nice to include a, a trombone glissando and it turns out that that section of the music was based on uh, the music of Arthur Pryor who was a world famous trombonist at the time who played in John Philip Sousa's band uh, with, with um, and then left that band and later formed his own band and, and began it's, to... It record. sounds like you, I, I can't think of the right word for it, like invented this creation, and created what might be a better word. And I'm wondering, do other people who do what you do, do they devote that much energy and care to what they're doing? I mean, you sound like you're so skilled and creative. Do other people... Well, I can only speak for myself. I don't know. I don't know the creative process of other uh, orchestrators uh, or arrangers. But uh, I, I really, since I knew this was going to be featured at such a high level event, I, I really did pour uh, as much energy into it as I could, just to make sure that it really did uh, honor the legacy of Granger. I mean, I can't think of another composer that's got uh, societies dedicated to him in London. White Plains and Melbourne, Australia, with uh, people so passionate about what it was that Percy created during his life. So mm -hmm. it's uh, it was really an honor to to try and uh, further that legacy of his. And the pieces that uh, that Granger uh, wrote, they still get played uh, 
very often to this day. In fact, Susan was just telling me a few minutes ago before we started that they have a, an alert set up on a database that any time a Percy Granger piece is programmed, they are alerted to that and there are basically performances of his music that take place almost on a daily basis all around the world. Um, and I'm not sure how you guys, how did you set that up? Is that um, I think you it's, it's on Google Alerts. I mean, okay. You just get into Google and mm -hmm. it says alert, type in Percy Granger. Okay. And then everything that's got the word Percy Granger I understand. Okay. just comes through to you. Right, so you're able to... So we're track. able. I mean, some of them are, you know, are not so that interesting in as much that they're sort of like the umpteenth performance of Irish Jim from County Derry. Sure. But then occasionally you get news of something a bit more exciting. So mm -hmm. we then, I take it and post it up on my Percy Granger Society Facebook page, okay. which now gets linked to the Percy Granger America Twitter account. Okay. So it's sort of, you know, communications are sort of moving, uh, you know, streaming from one site to another to keep people sure. informed. Mm -hmm. But uh, you're quite right. I mean, Granger's music does get performed. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, it just has a certain, uh, there's just a, a very listenable quality to it with everything that he did. He, he was able to just capture yeah. uh, something. I think one of the main things about his music is that it's so damn enjoyable. True. It makes people smile. I mean, when we were recording for the Shandor series, you know, um, countless uh, recordings, you know, a studio, when you have to record so much music for so much time on a CD, I mean, they weren't getting fed up, they just loved it. I mean, they'd come, you know, they'd finish the sessions all with smiles on their faces. Mm -hmm. So... And I think it's, it's sort of health-giving as well. I think people who go to a Granger concert get some beneficial health care from it, in a way. Right, right. Um, well, I certainly do. It's, ther it's very sure. therapeutic. Sure. Yeah. So, back to your question. I feel like there's so many things that I can try and answer regarding your question. Um, I'm just going to show you what um, what's actually in this original... Um, addition here, there's there are moments in here, and it's just easier to read off of this. Um, Percy was very clear in what he wanted in specific sections, and he always used the English language, and most music is notated with uh, Italian and Italian abbreviations. We, we see the letter P, we know inherently to play soft, but that's because it's an abbreviation of the Italian word piano, or the F that we see, we know to play loud because that's forte. So the the Italians sort of uh, have the monopoly on the language that's used usually, except Granger uh, was his own person in that way and would use uh, English phrases just right on the page and uh, it's, it's still a little bit visually interesting to uh, us musicians when we see it in English when we're usually um, translating this in our minds. So he writes things like uh, clatteringly or strumpy, banjo-like. Um, how do you get a piano to sound like a banjo? That's that, I, I would love to have heard him perform this. Uh, there's another spot over here, uh, just a little bit deeper in. Sharp, chippy, and dead rhythmic. Or um, my favorite one, just because I'm a trombone player, it says, like a brass band, explosive. <laughs> so, when I was writing my arrangement, I just tried to get inside the thoughts behind these words that he was writing on the page and tried to use that to uh, uh, become the basis of what instruments that I was using. So, during the passage that says strumpy and banjo-like, I wanted to get a very different sound and uh, the melody is actually hidden inside the left hand at this point of the piece. And so I thought it would be a great spot to feature the trombone section. So I, f I uh, built the accompaniment of the band around the fact that the trombones were going to be playing the melody right there with a little bit of light snare drum, some uh, woodwinds and brass, just a little bit over the top. And uh, also as I went through this piece, I tried to respect exactly where he had the melody, whether it was in the right hand in octaves or the left hand, things like that, just based on the way the hands worked together 
it really did determine exactly which instruments I wanted to combine so that it basically came across not only like um, Granger wrote it but also as close to the original piano as possible and one of the pieces that I used to uh, justify that type of philosophy was Ravel's orchestration of Pictures at an Exhibition by Mussorgsky. The uh, Ravel orchestration is arguably the most famous although there are many orchestrations of that piece but um, it was uh, studying that score for years and years trying to see how Ravel combined orchestral instruments to imitate the timbres of the piano that uh, gave me a little bit of basis as to how I was going to work on mine. So what what if, what word would you use to describe what you did here? Are you, are you would you be a composer or? Uh, well, so Granger is the composer. I'm merely the orchestrator. Orchestrator. Mm -hmm. Or I mean, in, in many ways, it's a transcription. Mm -hmm. But I'm coming up with new lines and uh, you know writing for each instrument as its own entity and in each instrument group as its own sort of section within the band. So I tried to pass the melody around as much as I could. Uh, just and again, it all it all always went back to you know what would Granger have done had he been assigned this uh, task. So what other, uh, uh, what other uh, composers have you uh, orchestrated for band, and how would you say they orchestrating them compares with orchestrating Granger? That's a great question. Um, the question was. Uh, which other pieces have I orchestrated and how does that uh, tie to, or, or how does that compare rather with uh, with orchestrating Granger? And I actually started uh, working with a piece by Shostakovich, who's a gallop from a ballet suite. And um, Shostakovich's music is already very wind heavy, wind and brass, with the way that he wrote for orchestra. So it was just a matter of translating the strings into different uh, wind and brass parts uh, with that orchestration. Uh, then I moved on to a project of an Olivier Messiaen organ piece called Apparition of the Eternal Church. Mm -hmm. And that, I basically tried to make that sound like Messiaen himself had done that. Because mm -hmm. Messiaen, there, there's evidence of him writing several of his organ pieces for uh, winds or orchestra. And then he also wrote several pieces just for winds without strings. So I tried to make it sound as though it was from Messiaen's mm -hmm. um, creative uh, philosophy. And uh, I've also done the four C interludes from uh, Peter Grimes mm -hmm. by Benjamin Britten. And that mm -hmm. was uh, sort of a long process just to try to get into the, the mindset of what Britten was orchestrating the, the way that he wrote. So I actually tried to do my best to leave the wind and brass parts as is mm -hmm. and then come up with brand new uh, wind and brass parts to sort of approximate the sound of the string section. So those uh, have also been recorded by the United States Navy Band mm -hmm. and uh, they're out uh, either on YouTube or on CD. But in comparison with Granger, I mean he th this is a whole different harmonic language where it's much more chromatic um, he's really starting to hint at some almost like pre-jazz harmony and then he even goes so far in a few of these sections where he's combining different keys at the same time. So maybe the, the right hand, for example, will be in D-flat major, which are five flats, and the left hand will be in F major, which is only one flat. And depending on how he's writing uh, various arpeggios or glissandos, things like that, um, it's uh, it's it's actually been described as an Ivesian dissonance uh, in reference to Charles Ives from around the same time. Mm. So, did you have anything you wanted to add about this? I feel like I'm just sort of. No, no it's fine, David. No, okay. it's very interesting. No, we were talking earlier about the use of keys in this in, in mm -hmm. connection with the the right. black music of Will Cook and the white music of yes. Arthur Pryor and this process of acculturation that Granger right. achieved. Right. So, in addition to uh, Will Marion Cook, the, what, him being the impetus for this piece with his uh, musical in Dahomey, uh, there was another piece by Arthur Pryor, as I said, who was the trombone player with John Philip Sousa. And um, in just finding these two original pieces, I noticed that Will Marion Cook's uh, original melody for, for this piece was in G major, 
but Granger put it down into F sharp major, and I always thought that was sort of an interesting twist. And uh, looking at the music, he has you know, even on the first page or so, uh, basically glissandos where you just take your fist and just sort of mash down the black keys, and that's a very pleasing sound actually because it's uh, basically just a pentatonic scale. It's the most readily available pentatonic scale, pentatonic scale being five notes, um, mm -hmm. F sharp, G sharp, A sharp, C sharp, D sharp, and that is the basis of music and cultures all over the world for thousands of years, <coughs> basically. You find those, you can find melodies based on that. Uh, so it made sense to me that, that he was in F sharp, and then I noticed that the music of Arthur Pryor was in F major, and the dominant key happens to play very importantly into these uh, sections of prior where the uh, glissandos that take place there are all on the white keys and I was concerned that the key relationship between F sharp and F was not going to be very playable by concert bands because most of our instruments are transposing. You've got B flat trumpets, E flat, alto saxophones, uh, English horn is in F so these keys they all start to add sharps on top of six sharps. So I was looking for a new <coughs> way to take this half-step relationship between the two keys and move it down chromatically into some other place that might make it easier to play in a concert band, but I couldn't find any two keys <coughs> right next to each other that were going to make it uh, any easier. So I decided to move the, the key signature of F-sharp into its enharmonic equivalent G-flat because winds are much able, they're, they're more easily played in uh, flat keys. And that way when we, you know, write for E flat or B flat instruments, we're actually just taking away a few flats instead of adding a whole bunch of sharps. <laughs> so that certainly helped. But it was at that point that I realized that Percy Granger had done just an amazing uh, feat where the music of the black composer was on all black keys and the music of the white composer was on all white keys. <laughs> and this is something that I don't think anybody had uh, come yeah. to quite realize yet, even though Ronald Stevenson was quick to notice that the piece was indeed uh, something to do with acculturation. Mm. Do you so. think it might be uh, uh, arranging any other uh, of Granger's pieces? Well, I guess it depends on if there's many other pieces left. I haven't uh, <laughs> actually plumbed the depths of the full catalog yet. I, I, I have to find something new yeah. for you. Yeah, well, I, I'm sure Barry would have a suggestion. Uh, you said there have been many uh, different arrangements of uh, pictures at an exhibition, so uh, That's true. just because someone has uh, arranged Granger, you could come up with something different. Right. No, it would be, it would be a, a worthy endeavor. Um, it's been uh, it's been a lot of fun working on this, and uh, the piece is now actually available through Peters. So part of our agreement with the Navy Band is that um, we were able to get it into print through Peters, which is um, is isn't that the main publisher in addition to your publisher? No, <coughs> no, Shots are the main publisher Shots, in addition okay. to Bardic. Okay. Um, Peters only did three works. They did Inder Homie, the three Scottish folk songs, okay. and uh, the two sea shanties. Oh, only, only the three pieces? Okay. Yes. Okay. And I, I engraved all three. Okay, well, so that was very well done. It's yeah. rather, it's, it's uh, very <laughs> legible. <laughs> and I can't imagine doing that on the typewriter you described. Uh, no, ago. it's true. Yeah, do you yeah. still have that? Is yes, you? I do actually. Yeah. You brought it here, no doubt. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pay all the extra luggage for bringing that over. Weighs a ton. No, it was shit. I I bought it in oh in the mid seventies, I think, and it it was it cost about fifteen hundred dollars then. Mm. And oh, goodness. Um, mm. it's a it's sort of like a museum piece now. Mm. I mean, it's it's I don't use it because we're now on computer technology. Mm -hmm. But um, it sits in my house, you know, under its cover. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I ought to donate it to a museum, but I don't know who want, who would want it. Because the thing was that at that period there were several music typewriters being invented. Because I did a bit of exploration at the time to find out which one to go for. And um, a firm in London that hired multiple banks of typists using the machine that I had. I don't know if you're familiar with the Olympia typewriter company. Um, well, basically, the one I have, it's a, it's an Olympia um, machine, 
with an 18 inch carriage oh. mm. and the the uh, type typeface um, is the normal letters have been removed and the music typeface has been soldered on so the keys for the t the keys for the typeface are very small but some of the music keys are that big because they have to you have to type the staff the staff and then once you type the staff you then enter all the notes separately as I said earlier mm -hmm. so um, it um, it uh, was useful at, at its time because there was no other technology available but of course it was another case of how you know you could uh, people could use typewriters and produce um, a mishmash, you know. Mm. Whereas if you use them properly, you could produce something that looked legible. And for the three Scottish folk songs that Peter's published, I actually very proud. I won the Paul Revere, Revere Music Award for wow. musical graphic excellence, mm. and I have the diploma at home. A Brit won a Paul Revere. I know, isn't that that's, ironic? That sort of <laughs> kind of tilted. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, I was very proud of the Paul Rivera Award, I can tell you. <laughs> but um yeah, so that was only the only the three the main American publisher of Grand Jim G. Sherman. Sherman. Okay. Which is now part of the music sales group. Okay. And um they have not done a, a great service to, to Granger's memory. Oh, I mean, they, they brought out a, 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 a rather, uh, well, a, I don't know, say poor, but I mean, it wasn't, why they didn't bring out Granger's original score of Blythe Bells, I don't know. So they brought out Robert Jager's um, arrangement of it. Okay. And this is what they've tended to do. They've not gone back to the original Granger scores. Mm. They've brought out other people's arrangements of them. So uh, I saw an opportunity there, so I issued um, Percy's original Blythe Bells. In I, uh, it was edited in conjunction with Keith Bryan, the Sousa man. Sure. sure. And I brought out um, um, the Bell piece, which is a, a band concert band uh, extemporization on the Dowland song. Now, I, oh now I needs must part which starts off with the tenor solo singing the Dowland tune and then gradually builds up into this really sort of weird sound world, you know, Gershwin-esque in places, it's mm -hmm. fabulous. And I did the Irish tune from County Derry in its, um, uh, in its more chromatic version, which is called County Derry Air. Okay. And I published uh, a section, a selection of the chosen gems for winds, which are uh, Percy's arrangements of other composers' music, like Ferro Bosco and um, the Spanish organist um, de Cabazon and Bach, and all, all you know, weird and wonderful things. And they they've all been recorded on um, a new set of CDs that Naxos Records have just issued. Um, the complete wind band works of Percy Granger on three CDs, performed by the Royal Norwegian Navy Band. Mm -hmm. So um, that's something to look out for. The, the, the first album's out, I think the second one's come out, and there's another one coming out. And that purports to be the, com well, I mean, it, 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 it doesn't purport, it is the complete, because I researched it all, and I found, I couldn't find any other band music. Uh, in existence, hmm. so it, it is. It is complete. So um, I don't know if we're ever going to discover anything new. Hmm. Well, maybe. Who knows? Somebody might uh, suddenly say, "Oh, I've got a Percy Granger manuscript in my in my attic." <laughs> hmm. Yeah, we actually took a look in the attic today. We did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's empty. Just to see if there's anything else up there. And David took a photograph to prove it. No, there was nothing there. I didn't want to get up on the ladder. No. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Sorry, David. No, no, say? that's fine. I, I so, thought we might just conclude, yeah. uh, unless there were any other questions. I wanted to uh, just take a minute and actually play for you the United States Navy Band recording of the piece that we did in 2015. And uh, this is just right up on YouTube for anybody to watch at any time. But 
we hopefully are set up here to just transition right into that. We just have to press this button here. Thank you. 